Thank you all. Uh, it's great to gather together and uh, um, I'd like to share a little bit about what we were learning as a family this morning uh, in our catechism. It says, uh, the question was, what is the church? I wonder how you would answer that question. But uh, the, the answer that we're learning is that a church is a community elected for eternal life and united by faith who love, follow, learn from, and worship God together. And we're going to be learning from God together from John chapter 3 this morning, where Jesus says that as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. We're united by faith. We're elected for eternal life. And uh, a while ago, we were celebrating the Reformation when the truths of the gospel were rediscovered by the church, that we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, based on his word alone, to the glory of God alone. So we're going to sing those wonderful truths again together. So let's stand and sing.
show. He broke a string, he was so excited. Yeah, it's very rock and roll. <laughs> Let's pray, shall we? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that we can come to you by faith in Jesus and by grace based on your word and it's all to your glory and we pray that as we love and learn from and follow and worship you together we pray that you'd bless us we pray that you'd speak to us and I pray for Morgan as he preaches to us that you would help him to speak the words that you would have him speak to us this morning, the message that you want us to hear this morning. We long to learn from you. We love you and we worship you. And we thank you that we can pray to you as our Father. And so as our Lord Jesus taught his disciples to pray, so we pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. We have lots of fun notices this morning. <clears throat> the first is we, we have Morgan here with us, who's come all the way from Monmouth. It's great to have you with us, and uh, we pray that your time with us will be blessed and will be blessed through your ministry. Uh, after the service, there'll be refreshments served downstairs, uh, as usual, and everyone is, is welcome to stay for a, a cuppa and a little something to nibble. Uh, so please do stay if you can. Then this evening, uh, we'll be back here at six o'clock and Morgan will be preaching for us again. On Tuesday at seven o'clock is Impact for secondary school aged children. And that's in Mount Elim in Pontadawe. Uh, on Wednesday at 9.45 in the morning is Little Lambs, a uh, play group for naught to four year olds and their carers. Uh, so if you know any naught to four year olds, please do invite them to come along. Um, and then that evening at seven o'clock, we have the Bible study and prayer meeting uh, with Mark. On Thursday at 4.30 in the afternoon is Explorers for primary school aged children, which is here in this building. And again, if you know any primary school aged children, do invite them to come along. And uh, then next Sunday at 10.30 in the morning, uh, we have Will Savory uh, coming to preach for us. Uh, we've, he's been here once before already. And then at six o'clock in the evening, um, Gareth Llewellyn will be preaching for us. But the really exciting bit of, of that, well, it's all exciting, but uh, an extra bonus is that after the uh, Sunday services next week, we'll be having a fun Christmas decorating party. So if you are able and uh, willing, uh, we'll probably have some Christmas music and we'll all get together to make this building uh, look nice and festive for the Christmas uh, Advent season. So that's next week on Sunday. Um, also, there's uh, some leaflets downstairs, some flyers. Uh, one of them has a whole list of things that are happening this month. Uh, so if you're wondering, oh, when's the date of that? And uh, what are we doing on that day? Then all of that information is on these sheets. So take that away with you, uh, put the, uh, the dates in your diary. There's also these flyers uh, for the Christmas services. So that's on the 18th of December, the, the family service uh, starring the children, uh, followed by a free buffet lunch. So uh, that's on the 18th. Then the Christmas Eve carols by candlelight service at five o'clock on Christmas Eve. Uh, and then on Christmas Day at 9.30, there'll be a short family service. So um, this is a great way to invite friends and family and neighbours and work colleagues and uh, school friends. So take these with you and think and pray about who you can invite to these services. 
In a similar vein, we have flyers for the men's curry night uh, on Thursday the 8th. It hasn't happened uh, since COVID days, so it's very exciting. It's back on at Chili Two's, and Will Savory, who will be preaching here next Sunday morning, he'll be speaking at that. So again, uh, take a bunch of these. I'm sorry, it's just for the men. Uh, sorry, ladies. Uh, so take some of these uh, and uh, give them to, to friends, invite them to come along. Um, and the idea is that uh, you, you pay for your friend to come so that they don't have to pay for the meal. It's a free meal for them uh, and you pay for your friend. Um, but the ladies have a meal as well. So uh, on Monday the 5th at 7 o'clock, here in this building, the ladies are having a meal. Um, and Deborah Samuel will share how God has worked in her life. Uh, RSVP by the 4th for both of those events so that we can uh, have an idea of, of numbers. Um, I feel like there was something else. Am I missing something? Oh, that's right, yes. So with these, with these events, uh, such as the ladies' meal, um, the ladies aren't going to the curry house. Uh, you're gonna be cooking. And so it'd be great if uh, you could gather together to help, not just with the ladies' meal, but other Tell, tell uh, an owner and Anna uh, if you're able to help out. Help with anything. With anything. Yeah, <laughs> and we'll talk to you about it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right, I think I've done enough. So <laughs> I'll hand over to Morgan. Thanks. Well, uh, hello, everyone. It is wonderful to be uh, with you this morning, uh, joining you to uh, worship the Lord. Now, I'm going to start with a children's talk. Okay, now I want you all, this is everyone, okay, to think, don't, you don't need to answer this, but think of something that definitely exists, but you can't see it, okay? Have you all thought of something that definitely exists, but can't see it? Y yes. The air. Yes. G yes. Jesus. Yes. Yeah, that's a great answer. God. God definitely exists, but we can't see God, can we? Or can we? You know, lots of people over the, over the centuries have done their best to try and find a way to see God. There's a story right at the start of the Bible called the Tower of Babel, okay? So I'm going to show you with my bit of paper here. Now, at the Tower of Babel, the people thought we could build our way up to God. We can build a giant tower and we will reach heaven and we will see God. Do you think that worked? No, no, it didn't work. In fact, the tower fell down and it was a disaster. But pe even people today do their very best to find God through religion. Okay, so we've got some sort of tower, maybe a chapel building here. People do their best to see God that way. It doesn't really work. Hmm, what about if we invented something? Maybe, maybe, a, maybe a new invention might help us to see God. So I've got here a plane. Do you think that'll help us to see God? Went really high in the sky in a plane. Do you think inventing a plane or something like that will help us see God? No. You know, there's an old scout song. It's a silly song, but it, it's true. And it says this, you'll never get to heaven on a ping pong ball because a ping pong ball is far too small. Yes, you'll never get to heaven in your father's car because your father's car won't go that far. Yes, you'll never get to heaven on roller skates because you'll roll right past those pearly gates. You'll never get to heaven on a jumbo jet because heaven's got no runways yet. So inventing things can't help us see God. Well, maybe, maybe we need to leave the Earth's atmosphere. Maybe we need to go into space in a rocket. Do you think that'll help us see God? No, no. Although in, uh, in the 1960s, there was a Russian called Yuri Gagarin. He was the first man in space. 
And when he came back from space, people asked him, did you see God in space? He said, no, no, I didn't see God in space. So if religion and, and building our way up to God doesn't work, if inventing things doesn't help us see God, if I don't know, going out the world and into space can't help us see God, what can help us see God? Yes? Yes, yes, we, we can see God when we get to heaven, but how do we get to heaven? I'll show you. If I've done this right. There we are. Through the cross of Jesus. Through the cross of Jesus. You see, when Jesus came to this earth, he was God in human flesh. And he dies on the cross. And when Jesus dies on the cross, he mends our broken friendship with God. Because we've sinned and we've done things wrong. We can't know God or see God. But because Jesus has died on the cross, he mends our broken friendship with God. Okay, I'm going to pray. And we're going to sing um, after we uh, pray. So let's, uh, let's pray together, shall we? Yes, Lord God in heaven, we thank you that you uh, love us. And that even though we do things that are wrong, you still sent us. Uh, Jesus, to, to take our punishment on the cross and to help us see you one day. We thank you that he has mended our broken friendship with you. We thank you so much for this. Amen. Well, we're going to sing um, Jesus strong and kind together.
Great. Well, if you have a Bible with you, turn in it to whoops, John's Gospel and Chapter 3. There's John's Gospel and uh, Chapter 3, and we're looking at the first 15 uh, verses of this uh, well-known chapter. So John's Gospel 3, verses 1 to 15. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher from God, for no one can do these signs you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when, when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which, that which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes. You cannot hear its sound, for you do not know where it comes from or where it, where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? And Jesus answered him, are you the teacher of Israel and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you of earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ever ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the son of man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the son of man must be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Amen. Well, let me uh, pray before we come and uh, sing another hymn together. Let's, uh, let's pray together, shall we? Yeah, our Father in heaven, we thank you uh, for this uh, wonderful passage which reminds us of your grace and your mercy to us. We thank you that we are reminded that Jesus has come into this world that he has uh, been lifted up for us. Father, we worship you because you are a holy God. But Lord, you are so holy that we fall way short of what you want us to be. We sin in thought, word, and deed. We, we sin in the things we do, and we sin in the things we have left undone. And we ask, Lord, this morning that you would uh, be faithful and just to us, that as we as we confess our sins to you, you would forgive us of our sins. Father, we thank you for this uh, glorious gospel of hope, that there is new life found in the death of your son. And we thank you that uh, Jesus didn't stay dead. He, he rose again on the third day and ascended to heaven, guaranteeing the, the resurrection and the eternal life of all who would turn from their sin and put their trust in you. Father, we ask that you would give us boldness as we uh, share this gospel with those around us. And Father, we ask that this gospel would be the centre of uh, our worship this morning, that uh, you would send your spirit to us this morning, that he would uh, convict us where we need to be convicted, that he would uh, take any uh, distractions from our minds and, and that. Your spirit would uh, enable our minds and our hearts to focus fully on worshipping Jesus this morning. Father, may, you, may, may your salvation visit this place this morning, we pray. Thank you for this wonderful gospel. Amen. Amen. Well, we shall uh, stand and uh, sing another uh, hymn together. Um, I pray thee, uh, speak, I pray thee, gentle Jesus, it's up on the screen. So let's stand and sing.
Well, if you uh, have your Bible with you, uh, turn back uh, to the passage that we read earlier, uh, John uh, chapter 3. Now, I wonder if you were given the opportunity to restart your life, would you take it? It sounds like some uh, strange uh, plot, doesn't it, for a sci-fi movie. If you could restart your life, would you take it? And if you did, I wonder what you would change. Now, in this passage, this is something that Jesus is saying isn't far-fetched at all. We all need to restart our lives in a way. And that's the message he is uh, putting across to Nicodemus. Nicodemus, you need to restart your life. You need to be born again. And the reason for that is that because of our sin, because we do things that are wrong, because we break God's law, we fall way short of what God wants from us. And there is no uh, plastering up. There is no undoing the damage that we have caused by our own strength. We need the work of the Spirit in us. We need all, whoever we are, whatever we've done, to be born again. And this is a shock for someone like Nicodemus because Nicodemus was a very religious man. He was a man who was interested in Jesus. And in a way, this is the same mistake that lots of people make today. They think that on the, on the last day, when I see God, because I was religious, because I was interested in Jesus, because I, you know, went to church and things like that, I should be fine. But these are two mistakes that Nicodemus makes. It's his religion and his interest in Jesus. So that's our first two points. Nicodemus' is two mistakes, his religion and his interest in Jesus. So let's look at verse 1. This, this, is, uh, the, this is religion, okay? Now, verse 1, now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. So verse 1, we are introduced to a Pharisee. A man named Nicodemus. He, we read, is a very respectable man. He's a Pharisee, so that means he's religious. He's a whole a, a pretty good person. Uh, more is more. We read that he is a member of the Jewish ruling council, that is the Sanhedrin. So he is a man of great prestige, as well as being somebody very religious. And in verse ten, Jesus even calls him Israel's teacher. He is the go-to guy if you have any theological questions. And that included among the Pharisees. He is your man. And so someone like Nicodemus may well have been very, very confident that in the end, when God's kingdom finally comes, he will be okay. He, of all people, will surely be in. His mistake, of course, is that he is relying on his, uh, on his Jewishness, his, his obedience to the, the Mosaic law as the grounds for his salvation. This will be enough, he thinks. And as a Pharisee, he would have obsessed over keeping these rigorous laws. You know, the, the Pharisees separated themselves from all the other Jews because they were the holy elites of their day. Not, not only did the Pharisees um, strictly obey all 600 odd laws that we find in the Torah, that, that is the, the, you know, the first five books of the, uh, the Old Testament, but they also burdened themselves, or the Pentateuch, sorry, that's the word. Um, they also burdened themselves with obeying all these oral laws as well. So they had, they, it wasn't just the written law, it was the oral laws. He was, as I said, what you might describe as a good person. A bit like the rich young ruler that, that Jesus meets. Remember him? He comes to Jesus. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says to him what he needs to do. He gives him a list of laws. And he says to Jesus, well, I've done all that. All these laws I have kept since I was a small boy, he says. And then Jesus points out to him his flaw. And he's hurt and he goes away sad. 
He's not too dissimilar to most people we might meet in the street today. You ask most people today, if God exists and you stand before him, where will you be going? Most people would say, heaven. You ask them why, and they will say, well, I'm a good person. Nicodemus's message, the, the, sorry, the, the message that Nicodemus receives from Jesus is that no, that's not how this works. If you think that you are going to, going to be good enough in and of yourself, you need to think again. So let me show you how this works. So that's Nicodemus's first mistake. He was relying on his religion. And it's the same mistake a lot of people today make, I think. The second mistake Nicodemus makes, and we can make, is that he's interested in Jesus. Look at verse 2. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. So let's, let's not be too harsh on Nicodemus. Yes, he's relying on his religion. He's relying on his Jewishness. But he is a man who is interested in Jesus. And his interest, I think, is, is genuine. He comes to Jesus with, with real questions. He, he's a seeker, isn't he? He is a legitimate seeker. So he approaches Jesus with these genuine questions. You see, if you read through the Gospels, um, you will find time after time that the Pharisees were always out to test Jesus. So in, um, in Matthew's gospel, uh, chapter 19, the, the Pharisees come to Jesus with a question about divorce. But we read, don't we, that they ask this to test him and, and, and try to trip him up. But Nicodemus' question isn't like that. Nicodemus is a genuine seeker. He is interested. Why? Well, by now Jesus had been gaining a pretty... A remarkable reputation. He was a miracle worker. At the end of uh, the end of chapter two, we we read that Jesus performed many other signs while he was in Jerusalem. Before that, Jesus had changed water into wine. Nicodemus may well have been a uh, may well have been a witness of all the signs Jesus was doing in Jerusalem. Maybe that's why Nicodemus comes. He recognizes behind the man that there is something special. These sorts of miracles hadn't happened since the, the days of Moses and then Elijah. And now we have Jesus doing the same sorts of things that Moses and Elijah were doing. It's little wonder that Nicodemus was interested. And we can see that, can't we, from his opening gambit in verse 2. We know you're a teacher from God. See, he recognizes something that, some truth behind who Jesus is. He's a teacher from God, yes. God's got to be with you. So what's your deal? So that's Nicodemus. Those are his two mistakes. We have a man who is religious. We have a man who is interested in Jesus. But there is something that is clearly amiss here. There is something that Nicodemus is missing. Well, let's look at what Nicodemus is missing. Let's look at Jesus' two statements to him. Um, Jesus' first statement to Nicodemus is that he needs to be born again. His second statement is that he simply needs to believe. Look at what Jesus says to him in verse 3. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. It's a strange reply, isn't it, to Nicodemus' question. What I think Jesus is doing here is deliberately directing the conversation uh, to show Nicodemus what he needs to hear. As we said, um, Nicodemus was a religious man. He, he, of all people, would be fine. But Jesus here goes on to shatter everything Nicodemus thought he knew. So that's why he tells Nicodemus, you need to be born again. What? Nicodemus? Does even Nicodemus need to be born again? Well, yes, he did. And we all do. Now, I want to pause here because the, the term born again can be quite unhelpful these days, can't it? Um, you describe yourself to somebody as a born again Christian. 
don't, you, you'd usually be greeted with an eye roll as though, oh, you're one of them. You're, you're, a, you're a fundamentalist. You're, you've become fanatical. That's not what born again means. No, it's none of these things. Uh, it's not that we have gone on a journey and we've had some strange experience and now we know we're born again. It's not that we have gone on a quest for self-betterment and we've achieved it and now we are born again. It's not that we have adopted a long list of uh, rigorous rules which we must follow and anyone who doesn't follow them is a lesser person than us. That's not what it means to be born again. It is not a, a reward that we achieve by what we have. It is something that God, by his grace and mercy, does in our lives through the Holy Spirit. It's that the Holy Spirit comes in. He cleanses us from our sin. He makes us a new creation. He gives us new birth. Remember, if you had a chance to restart your life, would you? Jesus is suggesting that that is not a far-fetched idea from a sci-fi movie. No, you can restart your life through the Holy Spirit. Um, I'm a big football fan. Um, given where I am in the world, I'm not going to tell you which football team I support. I'll leave that to your imagination. But say I were to go down to the, the coach of that team and I were to say, I want to be a footballer. And he graciously gives me a chance. And after one training session, he draws me aside and says, Morgan, you, you just do not have it. The only hope you have of becoming a professional footballer is if you were born again, if you restart your life. And that's the idea Nicodemus is receiving here. That's the idea Jesus is putting across to him. If you want to enter the kingdom of God, if you want to even see it, you need to be born again. You are nowhere near good enough, is what he says to him. He shatters his dreams, doesn't he? And there is no way that Nicodemus should have been surprised at this. Look with me at verses 5 to 8. Truly, truly, Jesus says, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Do not marvel. So in verse 7, he should not be surprised. Do not marvel at what I say. when I say to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not, you do not know where it comes from or where it, where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. And what Jesus is doing here is showing to Nicodemus that this idea of new birth isn't a new idea. It's been there all along in the Old Testament, the very book that Nicodemus was an expert in. If you turn to Ezekiel with me, Ezekiel um, 36, uh, chapter tw uh, 36, verses 25 to 27, we read this. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanliness, and from all your idols I will cleanse you, and I will give you a new heart, a new spirit I will put within you, and I will remove from you a heart of stone, and give you a heart of flesh, and verse 27, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and carefully obey all my rules. So this, this idea was in Ezekiel. If you turn to Psalm 51, had David, when he sits in with Bathsheba, says, create in me a clean heart, renew a steadfast spirit within me. That's verse Verse 10 of Psalm 51. The idea is there in the Psalms and the prophets. If you turn to Deuteronomy 30, verse 6, we read this. The Lord will circumcise your hearts and the hearts of your offspring so that you will love the Lord with all your heart and with all your soul, that you may live. So that's the book of the law. The law, the Psalms, and the prophets all point to new birth. Nicodemus should have known better. He should have, he should have known all along that that's how it worked. And Matthew Henry is particularly helpful here. Now, how do we know that we are born again? Well, Matthew Henry says, a birth is, uh, is the beginning of life, and to be born again is to begin to live anew, as those who have lived much amiss or to little purpose. 
We must have a new nature, new principles, new affections, new aims. By our first birth, we are corrupt, shaken in sin. Therefore, we must be made new creatures. So how do we know if we're born again? Well, we examine, examine ourselves. Do I have new uh, principles? Do I have new affections? Do I have new aims? Other questions might, that might be helpful to ask. Do I love God's people? Do I love his church? Do I long to see uh, new people come to know Jesus? Maybe the ultimate one. Do I in and of myself truly want to love and know more of Jesus day by day? And furthermore, Jesus saying this to Nicodemus also devastates everything Nicodemus thought he knew about the kingdom of God. For Nicodemus and many Jews at this time, uh, the kingdom of God would, would be a, a, a future thing that would happen. Uh, the Messiah would come. He would overthrow the enemies of God's people. At this time, it was the Romans. And the moment the Romans were overthrown, God's kingdom would be established. Uh, and it would be a new era for, for God's people. And this is what they were all looking forward to. But when Jesus comes, he establishes the kingdom. And then the, the kingdom will then be consummated in the future. So that in the meantime, anyone, Jew or Gentile, who turns from their sin and trusts in Jesus are in the kingdom. This is another thing that would have blown Nicodemus' mind. It's a spiritual thing. It's not, it's not a physical thing. It will be in the future when we, when we get to heaven, when, when the new heavens and the new earth are created. But in the meantime, we are in this in-between period. A little bit like uh, our own situation now with a monarchy. Charles is king, but he's not crowned yet. So we have this in-between per period. It's the same with the kingdom. And so... Here, Nicodemus has everything he thought he knew shattered. You must be born again. You're, you're not good enough, Nicodemus. And the, uh, the second statement Jesus gives him, verses 9 to 15, is that he simply must believe. How can we be born again? We must believe. So verse 9 um, Nicodemus questions uh, Jesus further. Uh, look, look with me at verse 9. How can these things be? He, he, he still can't get his head around this. Jesus responds to him, verse 10. Are you the teacher of Israel? And yet you do not understand these things. Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know. We bear witness um, to what we have seen. But you do not receive our testimony if I have told you of earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? Jesus is absolutely amazed that Nicodemus still doesn't get this. Not only Nicodemus, but, but the Pharisees, the you in these verses is plural. No, no one gets that. Nicodemus and his whole group of Pharisees, they still can't see it. They see Jesus. They see all he's doing. They're hearing his words, but they remain completely blind and confused to them. So what's the point in Jesus explaining these things to him further? That, that's kind of the summary of those verses. And Nicodemus is still, he's still bewildered. He still doesn't get it. So verses 13 to 15, Jesus makes it really simple for him. How can we enter into the kingdom? How can we be born again. How do I become a Christian, essentially? This is theology 101. How do I become a Christian? Well, it's we receive new life. We receive new birth. We are born again. We receive forgiveness. We, we, we enter into God's kingdom, not by our own strength, not by anything we have done, but by personal faith and faith alone in Jesus Christ. And Jesus shows to Nicodemus exactly how this works. And here he uses two Old Testament images. Okay, Again, he, he's referring Nicodemus back to the Old Testament like he did with the new birth. He shows him that he really, again, should have known this all along. 
So he, he refers to himself now as the son of man. That's there for us in um, verse 13. No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the son of man. The son of man, well, that, that, that's Daniel 7. Nicodemus, again, should have been familiar with this. Yes, Daniel 7. But what has the son of man descended from heaven to do? Well, verses 14 to 15 answer that for us. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. What he's doing here is referring Nicodemus back to a very famous Old Testament passage in Numbers 21. Numbers 21 verses 4 to 9. Um, in, this, in that story, the, um, the Israelites, they've left Egypt. They're, they're, in the, they're in the wilderness, and they start to grumble and complain against the Lord's servant, Moses. God isn't too happy with this because it, it's sinful. And so he lets loose in the, their camp. Um, I'm not sure what the collective term for snakes is, but uh, me, lots of like uh, poisonous snakes. And they go around and they bite, they bite the people. And the people who are bitten are infected and they start dying. It's a strange story, this, isn't it? But it, it shows us how seriously God takes our sin. And so the people who sinned, they, they, they are under God's judgment. They realize the error of their ways and they go to Moses and they, they cry for mercy. And so God, in his mercy, answers them and... He commands Moses to lift up a bronze snake and commands the people that whoever looks up at the bronze snake will be filled with life. They will be spared. And so in verse 9, Moses, uh, of, of Numbers 21, Moses made a bronze serpent, put it on a pole. When anyone was bitten by the snake, he could look at the bronze, he could look at the bronze snake and they would live. He would live. What Jesus is doing here is preaching the same gospel that we know and we are hearing today from the Old Testament. This story of the bronze snake, it consists of sin, judgment, belief, and healing. Our gospel consists of sin, judgment, belief, and healing, or salvation. And so now Jesus is here, here is, is linking the story of the bronze snake with the future narrative of his death. Uh, he, Jesus, you see, would come and he would be crucified as a result of our sin. He, like the bronze snake, would be lifted up so that anyone who would look to him would find life, would be, be forgiven. You know, in the story of the bronze snake, all the people needed to do was to look to the snake and believe. All we need to do today is to look to the cross of Jesus and believe. Is it really that simple? Is all we need to do believe and we will be born again? Yes. Yes, it, it is that simple. Is it believe and go to church? No, it's simply believe. Although going to church is a good thing to do. Is it believe and pray and read my Bible every day? No, it's just believe, although praying and reading your Bible every day is, is a good thing to do. Is it? Is it uh, believe and give to Christian charities? No, it's simply believe, although giving to Christian charities is, again, a good thing to do. It is simply believe. Believe in Jesus. Believe in God. Believe in his promises, and what he can do for you. That's how new life enters us. That's how new life has always entered into people, even in the Old Testament, simply by believing in Jesus. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says, and you will be saved. Now, I wonder whether Nicodemus ever fully uh, grasped this. I mean, we have evidence in uh, John 19 that Nicodemus does become a believer. John 19, verse 39, this is after Jesus is dead. Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, 
came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes and about 70 pa- 75 pounds in weight. And so he comes and he honors Jesus' his body after he dies. So, so it seems as though Nicodemus did finally take it in. But I wonder when he fully grasped it. Maybe if Nicodemus was among the crowd at the cross. Maybe it's as he looked up at the cross. Maybe as he looked up at Jesus being crucified. I wonder whether it's then it finally dawned on him. Maybe he recalled the conversation. As Moses lifted up the bronze snake, so the Son of Man will be lifted up, that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. What Jesus is doing here in this passage is inviting Nicodemus to put his trust in him. And the mere fact that this, this is recorded for us in the Bible for us to read means that that very same invitation that Jesus made to Nicodemus goes out to each and every one of us today. What will you do with Jesus? Will you remain disinterested if that is where you are? Will you try and uh, work your way up like Nicodemus was doing? Will you just remain at a safe distance but partially interested? That's the only way we can have new life is by believing in him, by putting our faith in him, by looking to the cross and receiving forgiveness of sins. I pray that you do that this today. Amen. We are um, going to uh, sing um, another hymn uh, before, we clo- before we pray and close. Uh, Tis finished, the Messiah dies. A hymn that uh, speaks with these wonderful words of the uh, death of Jesus and what it means for us. So let's stand and sing, Tis finished, the Messiah dies.
Now may the God of peace, who brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that may that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. <laughs>